Welcome to week five. As we are moving into the expository message, let me mention a couple housekeeping items, and you may have figured this out already, that uh, the COVID-19 has sabotaged me. I know as it has you. And uh, with the changing of our syllabus, changing of our schedule, I ended up rewriting the syllabus several times. And so I pulled in materials from previous years. And there's other materials sitting in there. I did not have time to get them cleaned up. Point is, I hope you follow the modules. Stay on top of the modules. Let that be the driving force. The, the listing of assignments, some of, some of those are old and drawn in from previous years. So just as a housekeeping item, stay close to the modules. And I'm doing my best to get those things published as it's timely to have them published for you week by week. Uh, again, COVID-19 has sabotaged me like it has you, and I found myself with way more responsibilities on me. So moving into the expository message, here's what Wikipedia says concerning that it is an explanation of preaching. Uh, expository preaching is a form of preaching that details the meaning of a particular text or passage of Scripture. It explains what the Bible means by what it says. Exegesis is technical and grammatical exposition, a careful drawing out of the exact meaning, exact meaning, exact meaning of the passage in its original context. So with that in mind, one of the greatest expositors is Spurgeon. And uh, one of the assignments here is for you to do Psalm 119. You'll see it there in the module. Psalm 119, part B, and all it is is jumping to the, to the second strophe of the Psalm 119, and uh, it's about 20 minutes long. There's, I forget how many of those strophe there, but they're all separated by the Hebrew letters, and of course, it's the longest psalm, but the point is that it's expository in detail. He gives one line, and then he sticks directly, specifically to that particular line. That's an expository sermon. It, it is the Bible plus nothing else. Maybe applying it, explaining it. Now, Chap Chapel said that it is informational and it is uh, uh, illustration, information, illustration, explanation, uh, application. So I'm a little tired. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you're going to probably have to watch this video in multiple segments anyway. So, but Spurgeon is an excellent example. And on top of that, uh, the point is that Psalm 119 verse 7 says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So our course here is a transformational course. It's not just listening to Spurgeon and seeing what an expository sermon is. It's letting your soul be converted by the power of the law. So you give yourself to the law. And recognize it's changing your soul, converting your soul. And so, believe it or not, here we've got an Amber Alert coming in, which just sabotaged me again. And uh, so, uh, my soul needs to be changed. So, I noticed when studying the uh, writings in Deuteronomy where uh, Moses says, Choose life or choose death. I set you before the options. Choose life, choose death. The word choose there is actually in the perfect. So Hebrew has two tenses, perfect, which means it is an action that started and completed, or the imperfect, which is an action that began and is yet to be completed. It's ongoing action, sometimes translated future tense, sometimes translated present tense. English, we have the three tenses. Greek has seven tenses. Hebrew only has two tenses, perfect and imperfect. And so there's other moods, but tenses are only two. And so uh, you, you have in the choose option of, of uh, uh, Moses, it's a perfect statement, meaning you've already made the choice. Now, when you look over at Joshua, where he says, uh, choose life, I'm setting before you your options. As for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. And uh, that choose is an imperative. It's a, the mood imperative. And it's a command. It's a mandate. Whereas Moses is telling us something 
choose in a sense that the choice is already made. It's in the perfect tense. An action started and now complete. So that's so powerful to think that there can be choices inside of me that are already made. As a matter of fact, Dr. Peter Weibrow, Weibrow, in his book uh, uh, on the order of uh, fine-tuned brain, well-tuned brain, I encourage you to read it. Phenomenal read. But he says that 80% of our choices, of our decisions, are already made before we even come to the decision-making process. So it's driven by either the lower brain or the upper brain. Either it's called the reptilian reactive brain or the reflective frontal cortex brain. And so uh, the limbic brain is the lower brain. Frontal cortex is the upper brain. And uh, frontal cortex is where I think and give consideration and cognition and reflective reasoning as I'm considering a decision. But only 20% of my decisions fall into that category. 80% are already made by the by the lower uh, uh, reactive brain. And I need to get my reactive lower brain uh, conforming to God's way and God's will. This is transformational. This is New Testament. This is what Jesus wants to do in us. Is And, and so much here. I wish to God we could sit together in the classroom. But anyway, uh, to recognize that Jesus teaches me that I can have a reconciled place in him to where I'm, I'm not driven by anger, not driven by lust, not driven by the base elements and base appetites. And the things that operate normally in me can be silenced as I've been transformed by transforming initiatives. He teaches me in the Sermon on the Mount primarily, but don't have time to get into that. But to say here that Peter Weibry says, my lower brain needs to be transformed. I encourage us converting our soul to the law of God. There's three things primarily you can do to get yourself transformed. Number one, it requires imagery. Get your eyes to see the right stuff. Create the right imagery in your brain. That, that's Philippians 4 and 8. And where that we think on positive things. We use imagery because that's what I, my brain thinks in. My brain does not think in words. In, in a, 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 it thinks by pictures. And I need to put pictures in front of me. Number two is by the power of confession. Now we know, scientifically speaking, that I can hold a thought in a locus of my brain. Sorry, I'm going fast, but you're going to see why. There's an hour and a half following me. But anyway, there's a locus in my brain that holds a particular memory, and it stays there running and ruminating like, like the hamster in the wheel until I finally, finally, finally can release it. And the way to release it is I have to speak it by my mouth, by confession, and it'll take that little minuscule thought low held in the locus of two or three cells, and it'll literally pass through all six regions of the brain. Every region of the brain is now engaged, and then it goes out of my mouth. Both ears hear it, and now I have engaged both hemispheres of my brain as I now have converted a minuscule thought into a global experience. And incidentally, journaling, writing does the same thing with both eyes seeing it. So number two is confession. Power of confession transforms the soul. Number three is habituation. By habit, it takes 21 days to build a new habit. By habituation, that's how I really fine-tune my brain, getting that limbic brain in alignment with where God wants me to be. I, cognitively, I get it. I understand it. I read it. I say, yeah, I really blew it yesterday. My anger bubbled over. But I can be so reconciled to Jesus and utilize imagery, confession, and habituation to reshape my lower brain. And that's what we want to do. So Psalm number 119 is a reshaping as we give ourselves to the law of God, the law of God, the law of God. A season of my life, I literally listened to Psalm 119 every morning, first thing when I woke up, and last thing every night when I went to bed because I wanted to get some things in my life restructured by the law of God that converts the soul. And so uh, listen to Spurgeon, work Spurgeon, and realize transformation comes. Now, the great expositor Spurgeon gives us examples of expository sermon. 
Expository has to be done by exegetical methodology. So this is deep. There's two things we're doing here. In the segue following me, you'll notice it's a previous uh, video that I've done. I didn't want to redo the whole thing, simply didn't have time. And in that previous video, there may be some reflections on other assignments. Ignore the other assignments. Stick to the modules that's printed out in your page that follow the syllabus on 2020 <laughs> preaching course, okay? And so uh, the exegetical uh, responsibilities are twofold. Number one, you're going to pull down that exegetical, hermeneutical, homiletical outline. I'm not worried about the homiletic side of it yet. But the exact exegetical hermeneutical we need to pull down, and it's a word doc that you're going to literally fill in the blanks, work it out as, number one, you're working on the translation. Now, translation you're going to do next week in particular. If you can get this, friend, you're going to get a lifetime gift. I promise you in preaching, you're going to receive a lifetime gift. And I'm sure Dr. Brickle deals with a lot of this stuff. And uh, he's going to do it differently from me. And his way, if you want to do it that way, is your best way. If the way I'm showing you works better for you, follow it. It's a lifetime gift that you and I are operating correct, appropriate hermeneutics that's driven by appropriate exegetical work, homework. So you got to get a translation, get the translation. And the next time I'll be showing you how you're going to lose, use Logos Bible software. If you haven't got it yet, go ahead, uh, ask Brother Erickson how you're going to get Logos Bible software on your computer, and you're going to learn how to do the exegetical guide. All right, don't point at nobody, but you're going to learn how to do the exegetical guide. And, but on, on, on this series today, I'm going to explain to you how that in this exegetical effort, this is part one, next week comes part two, where you really lay out the uh, translation. You're going to be using uh, uh, canon criticism and textual criticism methodologies. You need to be familiar with all these critical methodologies that I'll explain in the next video how in the late 1900s, uh, the end of the 20th century, German scholars started dealing with that sacred text and unpacking it, and it's only a strength to us today. Uh, using all these various methodologies, you're going to consider the literary context, that's actual, where the words are, what the words are in the literary context. That includes genres, structuralism, rhetorical, critical methods, and I explain these things in the upcoming video part uh, that is in the first, oh, I forget what, but anyway, uh, you're going to do the broad context, literally, getting the genre, what kind of genre it is, the structures it is, and then applying, if, if you want, rhetorical, how it sounds, what types of rhetoric is coming out, and then additional observations, and then the narrow context, right down to the very text. See, that's the reason why I didn't want you getting more than two verses, and you're going to be wishing that you just did John 11, 35. <laughs> Jesus wept. No, you can't do that one. But anyway, uh, then you're going to look at the social, historical, cultural context, utilizing source criticism, tradition criticism, redaction criticism, and form criticism. And with a broad stroke, you look at source and tradition, redaction, narrow context. Now, where that uh, passage you're dealing with is in the context of the Zitzen Laban, of where those people are living in at that time. And so dealing with the Zitzen Laban, I deal with Zitzim Laban, which is life setting in the next upcoming segment of con uh, video. And uh, then you're going to deal with the pers purpose and needs addressed and additional observation to where now, as you've dissected it, you have dug around this thing. Now you can put it back together into a synthesis of the hermeneutic and getting the meaning and the intent of the author and the meaning and intent of the Holy Spirit, giving us a key a summary. You're going to write all this stuff in and a significance of what you're going to aim to preach, what your topic, what your effort is to preach and the big idea, what the passage is all about, all in one line, the, ex, the uh, expository message. That is the big assignment here, okay? You're going to do that today. You're going to download that. <laughs> That off of your uh, module, module number five today, and you're going to use that template of the Word doc 
that you're going to follow and you're going to submit back to me in Jesus' name. Okay, you got that? And then next week, dear friends, I hate to tell you, but it's going to be whew, just a plethora of unpacking all kinds of stuff in a lengthy, lengthy video as I'm walking you through Logos Word. Uh, I'm Logos uh, Bible Software. I oftentimes get Word Biblical Commentary mixed up because I rely on it so much. But uh, anyway... This is what you're doing next week is that it's going to give you the translation. Now, in the video upcoming, as I walk through 1 Corinthians 11, you will see that I'm doing both. I, in this video, uh, I have on the screen the details of the translation. You don't have to do that in your actual expository outline that is due uh, today or this week. Uh, you will have to do it next week in your expository, exegetical, real, real difficult, hard work digging around the project, getting your translation. After we get translation, you'll bring that back into your exegetical outline that we're working on now. And uh, I tell you, get translation from a couple other places like the word biblical commentary. At this point, don't even do that. At this point, uh, you're going to get your own translation as you dig around uh, utilizing the tools I'll give you next week, particularly from the Logos Bible software. And when you get this again, it's a lifetime gift. I promise it's a lifetime gift because now you got tools. Back when I learned Greek and Hebrew, I didn't have these tools. We had to know the language in detail. Now you got computer tools that really let you skip so much necessity of knowing all kinds of detail of language. I still encourage you to take the languages, but it's not quite as absolutely significant as one day it once was so but still it's extremely helpful to be able to read in the original text and so the sermon uh, is more than the expository sermon it demonstrates the one upcoming it demonstrates a lot of the research and shows you uh, the end product of research while also it's demonstrating expository as i'm dealing with the topic extremely important topic of submission. Yeah, I know it sounds like uncut hair, but no, no, no. First Corinthians 11 is truly about submission to authority, yielding to authority. That's your quick intro. And I'll see you in another setting from two years ago uh, in another video. And here. It's the expository sermon video that you're preparing for. And uh, this may be the more difficult, one of the more difficult sermons for you to put together because we're not familiar with expository sermons in, in uh, Pentecostal circles, but uh, you're going to see my expository sermon that uh, I will basically go through line by line from the, from the biblical text. So that's an expository sermon, basically line by line from the biblical text that uh, you've done a great deal of work on. Again, studying from Robinson, uh, the work of Brian Chapel is a supreme work on an expository sermon where that you're just taking it line by line, biblical text, pulling out of the biblical text what the text is saying. What is the meaning of the text? So I encourage you to spend time in this area because it's going to enhance and develop you as well as you're going to need a piece of this for your final sermon. You're going to be submitting to me an exegetical outline for this final sermon, as well as you'll do an exegetical outline for this expository sermon. So the expository sermon is pulling you to another level where we're requiring you to do the exegetical outline. So to help you, the exegetical outline is in Canvas, online the template uh, a template for the exegetical outline in canvas go there download the file it's a word doc so it's only a template but you must use this word doc template for your exegetical outline so you are going to walk through the exegetical outline template that i've provided if you want to put things on pause right now go ahead Go to the canvas, pull it down. You can follow me through as we're going to look at this exegetical outline template that uh, is broken into two major pieces. First of all is the analysis of the text. 
where you're going to slice it, dice it, examine it, study it, uh, decompose it. You're going to break it into pieces. Uh, it's kind of like that uh, you got a biblical text and you look at it as you're flying over in a helicopter. And now we're going to land the helicopter and we're going to uh, look into the text, roll the stones over, see what's in there, dig it out piece by piece. After we've done the exegetical work of slicing and, and, and uh, piecing it out, parsing it, then we're going to put it back together. second large piece to the work is the synthesis. After we've torn it into a zillion pieces, then we resynthesize it uh, back into what is the text trying to tell us. And what the text is trying to tell us is the meaning, the hermeneutic to the text. What's the real understanding of the text? And as I've given it to you there in your outline, what is the intent of the writer, of the author? In many cases, it's one of the gospel writers or the Apostle Paul. What is the intent of the writer? Secondly, and most importantly then, would be what is the intent of the Holy Spirit? Of course, the real author of the Bible is God. And so what does God intend for us to get out of the teaching? So to get there, we first have to do the analysis. So looking at the analysis, I've got in the template four primary areas that we're going to use to take this text and parse it, dig it out, slice it up, study it. First of all is the Zitzenleben. The Zitzenleben basically means the life setting. So what is the historical, social, cultural setting? And we'll be using redaction criticism to ascertain what is the historical, social, cultural setting. So to get it into context, this biblical text, what is the biblical, historical framework, the background, the backdrop? Where is this text seated, placed in what, in what life setting? So for example, if it's Old Testament, if it's uh, pre-exilic, post-exilic, if it's, uh, uh, for example, uh, something from Nehemiah, something from Esther, what is the Zitzenleben? Is it uh, during exile? What's the context? What's the background? Uh, the life setting, uh, socially, culturally, historically, as we're doing redaction criticism. So a piece of the critical methodology is to understand that Primarily, uh, pri prior to the 20th century, uh, biblical text was so sacred that you wouldn't cut it into pieces like that. It was just something you read. But uh, German scholars back at the beginning of the 1900s, uh, really late 1800s, began to examine biblical text, not in a sense, honestly, they didn't quite consider it so sacred that they could cut it into pieces, they could examine it, they could be critical of it. And so these, these critical methods emerge, and really, rather than weakening the text, they strengthen the text. So we're going to use Zitzenleben to, and redaction criticism to ascertain the historical, social, cultural setting, the context, historically, socially, culturally, and uh, helping us understand then what is the backdrop. Uh, along the same line, as we are considering Zitzenleben, we're going to consider source criticism. So we've done redaction criticism, getting us the historical context. Now source criticism, meaning who is the author? Who wrote it? In my expositional um, sermon, the author is Paul. So Paul writes, and we understand that it's a part of the canon. So there's canon criticism. Again, I want you to be aware of the critical methodologies that... There are all these critical methodologies that are useful. You'll be reading them, reading about them in the various commentaries. Need to know what they are about. So uh, we have the development of the canon. Paul's writings are in the canon. And uh, canon being the scriptural canon that's been given to us. And, uh, and uh, then uh, we watch as Paul writes something that's in the canon, but yet it gets compromised and polluted in the Corinthian church. And uh, again, some redaction criticism there on my piece up and coming. 
This is the exegetical template that now is being filled in. The first piece filling in is the Zitzenleben. Again, using redaction criticism, using source criticism, and using canon criticism to help us establish the Zitzenleben. The next uh, piece in the, in the template is the literary context. So yes, we need to know the social, historical, cultural backdrop. That's uh, the context that the biblical text finds itself in, in terms of the culture. But now, let's see where the biblical text is in the context of the biblical framework, of the literary context. So uh, my piece, again, that I'll be bringing to you, I won't get into this in the expository sermon, but so you can know in the backdrop, this work has been done. This exegetical outline is developed that this framework holding the passage of 1 Corinthians 11 that's going to deal with authority, the framework holding it is agape. The agape love feast that needs instruction because it's been corrupted and we're going to use various forms, critical methodologies to help us understand uh, what the literary context is. In particular, structuralism. So structuralism is an awareness. We must be aware that the biblical texts are written by Hebrews that have Hebraic thinking. They think in Hebrew terms. So uh, they think in concentric circles. We in Western thought don't think like this. Western thinkers are linear. We go from Roman number one to ABC, Roman number two, ABC. We think linearly, logically from point A to point B. Hebraic thinkers, they don't think like this because they live in a oral community. They're, there's a transition, I'm sorry, a transmission of information through the oral community that it's not written down. They don't have books. Uh, yeah, they got scrolls. Scrolls are papyri that's very expensive to develop. And certainly they used it, but it, it wasn't used to the extent that we use books today. And, and before they had papyri, they had parchment. <laughs> and so parchment, well, how do you get a parchment? Well, you got to go kill an animal. You got to take its hide. You got you to sun dry the hide. And then you got to use a particular marker and etch into the hide every single letter, and, and uh, you can't make a mistake. And so parchments are very difficult to deal with. So they couldn't just write stuff down and pass it along in written form. It was communicated orally. So in oral transmission, there's tools that the Hebrews used, and they would present things in triads, remembering things. Oh, yeah, there's three of those, there's three of those, there's three of those. So oftentimes, as an example, think about Matthew 28, 19. It's a beautiful, polished out Hebraic uh, effort to present what we call the Great Commission. So there's the bookmarks, the beginning and the end. See, that's the way this concentric thinking operates. The, at the very middle is the core, and towards the outer areas, there are layers. You, you can, when you do word biblical commentary, which I encourage you... <laughs> Use word biblical commentary in this assignment. So word biblical commentary course is in the library. It's in the Logos. If you, if you purchase it, I recommend that you purchase it. It's worthy of a lifetime purchase. Word biblical commentary, a great work of scholarship. Uh, tragically, the 1 Corinthians 11 section is still uh, remaining to be published. But anyway, most of it's published and available. So they will give you uh, the structures, and it's presented in what's called a chiasm or a chiactic structure. So that's where you get A, A prime, B, B prime, C, C prime. So what's going on there? Well, they give it in this presentation. I'll put it to the camera in the order that you would see it. A, A prime, B, B prime, C, C prime. What are they doing is trying to take the concentric type of the Hebrew thinking and present it in the chiastic type of a structure that, like the Hebrew would write, 
they would give the thought as an A, and they would echo that thought in A prime. We also call these markers, or some people call them bookends. So we have it bookends as here's the beginning, here's the ending, here's the A, here's the A prime. So when you read the Bible knowing that it's written by Hebrew authors that think like this, then it makes so much better sense. When you read Paul, for example, Paul does it all the time. When you break him into structure, so this is structuralism, the critical methodology of structuralism. When you look at the structure of the A, and for example, in Romans chapter 1, you get the A, and then way on back into Romans chapter 16, you get the A prime. And you can literally outline Paul's entire books into A, A prime, B, B prime, C, C prime. And uh, then it makes incredible sense. <laughs> they, they, they try to outline Paul from a Western standpoint. And they're saying, wow, how do we get this Roman numeral one, A, B, and C, you know, packaged into all this, all the, and it doesn't work. So you're getting the idea. So take a look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. It's a bookend. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Look at the other bookend. So I am with you always to the end of the age. There's the bookends of Matthew 28, 19. But as we move towards the center, it's the center pieces that's the most important. It's what we call the core or the nugget. It's like the apple core. In the apple core, of course, is the most important stuff, which happens to be the reproductive material, the seeds, right in the core. Likewise, the core of the Hebraic thinking patterns carries the most significance of the, of the material. All right, so look at Matthew 28, 19 again. The, the book in, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now, go ye therefore... You know, here it is in King James. Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. I'm with you always to the end of the world. The other book in. Now, actually King James does a fairly lousy job <laughs> in translating Matthew 28, 19. Matter of fact, I'm not familiar with any of the translations that really unpack it like it is. All right? So this is where it's so important to dig in. Now, if you know Greek, if you know Hebrew, then you need to use your language. I strongly encourage you to get the language if you haven't gotten it. So it's never a waste of time to study the original language. Unless you're in the original language, you are still working through a layer of translation, and it's very difficult to get to the hermeneutic. Now, again, how important is it that we have the hermeneutic? Well, it's so extremely important because we're dealing with the Word of God and to communicate what is the intent, what is the significance, the meaning, what's the Holy Spirit trying to communicate. How important is it to get it right? You know, preaching about earthquakes in divers places, because King James mentions it, does not mean preaching about earthquakes in the oceans. Yeah, that's the way you can spin it out from King James. That's where divers are, is in the oceans. But what kind of hermeneutic is that? What have you communicated? Truth is, you aren't being true to the Word of God. When somebody, of course not you, but when somebody preaches that kind of message, they're not true to the Word of God. When somebody grabs a hold of Strong's Concordance and says, this word means this, but it can also mean this and also mean this, and they give seven different reasons or, or tra tra translations, what's it mean? And then take the translation and insert it back into the original and preach a complete different message than what is the intent of the author. To you, my friends, to me, that speaks to me, hey, I'm playing with the Word of God. Read over there in Revelation how that there's a curse added to anybody that adds to. We can't do that. We must seek to get the appropriate hermeneutic. This is extremely important to get the study, to do the hermeneutic. And to get the hermeneutic best is to go to the original language. Working at getting the hermeneutic is so important. So to really get it, yes, I'm translating. Translating word by word, that's important, okay? But more important than the word by word translation 
is the syntax. Syntax, S-Y-N-T-A-X. The syntax, what does the word mean in the sentence? What's the flow of the sentence? What's the meaning of the entire sentence that happens to be packaged in a paragraph that is written in the Greek language for New Testament usage, which is the most specific language given to the human being? Seven different uh, verb usages. Uh, 17 different usages for the genitive case. So extremely explicit. We lose so much of this in English, original language. Look at the syntax of each word. So for example, go ye therefore, preach in, uh, well back it up. All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And then go ye therefore, okay? That word go is not an imperative. So you look at the word in the syntax, study it, parse it. It's parsed into a participle. It's a verb particle, a participle. Participles in English most usually is a verb that's been converted uh, into a state of being by adding on an ing. So the best translation of the word go, or go you therefore, would be going. It should be translated going. It's a state of being as represented in a participle. So going. And then the next phrase, make disciples. In the Greek text, it's a single verb. We, again, don't have a single word that translates this single verb. I personally coined the word disciplize. I, I wrote it into a thesis. It's in the library in the university. It's an official word now as it's held in the library of Vanguard University. Disciplize. It's similar to deputize. It, it's a verb that says take an individual and make them a deputy if you're going to deputize them. Or take an individual and make them a disciple if you're going to disciplize them. So. Jesus is saying, going, disciplize, that's the only imperative. And then come two more participles, uh, the participle um, baptizing them. Now watch, there's a triad that packages the word baptizing. So the triad is name of Father, well, in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Of course, there's only one name, we know the name, hallelujah. We know, ask anybody what's the name of the son. They're going to tell you, come on, there's a name, and son is not the name. All right, you guys get it. Father's not the name. Holy Spirit's not the name. Jesus is the name, all right? But in the literary context, we're using Hebraic uh, tools, and, of course, we're dealing with Jesus Christ, the most humble man that ever walked. And no place does he reiterate his own name. We know what his name is, praise God. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So here we have name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Baptizing is the participle. So we have going as participle. We have baptizing as participle. We have a third participle, teaching. Teaching them to observe all things. Now this is really cool because it's reflective of what Moses did with the children of Israel concerning the commandments. Obey everything. All those commandments. Obey them all. What Jesus instructs, we are going, we are baptizing, we're teaching. Going, baptizing, teaching. Going, baptizing, teaching. So watch. You have these three participles that are modifying the main verb, disciplize. Make disciples. It's modifying the verb, the imperative. All right? Now look how it did it. It did it by putting one of the participles in front of the main verb. It put two of the participles after the main verb. See, it's a Hebraic way of approaching. Now, how would we do that in our language? Well, we would say, Roman number one is, uh, uh, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. Roman numeral two, make disciples. A, going. B, baptizing. One, two, three, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. C, teaching them to observe all things reflective of Moses. See, you get the idea? Our way of thinking is linear, way different than the concentric circles. 
the point here is, get it. <laughs> you are studying a Hebrew text written by Hebrew authors that think in concentric circles. And the only way to unpack this is through structuralism. Word biblical commentary uses a lot of the, of the critical methodology of structuralism when it gives you the chiactic structures. When you look at your text, most likely there's a word biblical chiactic structure that's going to be applied. If not, look at it yourself. You can see the markers. You can see the concentric circles in just about every single text. Now, other structures that are used are other Hebraic type of tools in writing. And I can't get into all of it, obviously, but another one that's used much in, in the uh, poetic writings, like in, in the wisdom literature of Job and, and uh, Psalms, Song of Solomon, and so forth, uh, you see a lot of quotations, of course, of these passages in the New Testament, but this, the structural method used is called parallelism. Parallelism is when one statement's given and then it's echoed, almost identical in concept, but completely different in terminology. Again, not being true to the text, I've watched many people develop a hermeneutic that unpacks one line meaning one thing and another line meaning something else. That is false. <laughs> Oops, a strong term. But I feel quite passionate about this, that our hermeneutic needs to be right. That when in using the Hebraic type of a structure, they're only echoing the same thing. It's not a diabolical different. It's a reiteration of the same concept. That's the way they operate. That is the getting into the mind of the author. And of course, from that, then we can understand the hermeneutic. So as we are working on this, then we are, we are uh, putting the, 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 the material, our text, into the literary context, primarily using structuralism. And we can also use form criticism, uh, that there's forms that are, that are evident, uh, that there are structures that are evident uh, as forms. And uh, maybe there's rhetorical criticism that, that what's being offered is a rhetorical type of a statement. And uh, tragically, again, from language, we lose a lot of it. Word biblical is pretty good at pulling in some of the rhetorical stuff. I encourage you again to take a look at it, for, for, especially in uh, the poetry passages. If any of your work's in poetry, then you'll see that there's structures and there's rhetorical devices being used, like the meter or the speed, the, the uh, beat, if you will, the meter of the words. The, if you read it in Hebrew, it would follow. That's what's going on there in your word biblical commentary when there's a 2 plus 2, a 3 plus 3, following those particular psalm passages. So this stuff's important. The hermeneutic is extremely important. So then... You're going to work on the translation. You're going to give me the translation. If you can't do anything else, write it directly out of Word Biblical Commentary. They've done a lot of work in developing a translation that's quite good. Look at the other translations. Do not give me King James. Loud and clear. No King James. No new King James. Give me something that's a little bit more scholarly. That's, I know King James and New King James are close to the text. I get that. And, uh, and, uh, and I trust we've done enough textual criticism to know that King James, New King James come from Texas, Receptus, which of course is the, uh, the manuscript, uh, the manifold manuscript uh, used the most. The terms are just slipping me right now. But anyway, you guys got that. You also know that, hopefully you know that the NIV, some of the more uh, later scholarship done, in developing of the other text is they're drawn from the Alexandrian text and I know there's a lot of debate as to which one is the appropriate text my answer is don't use necessarily either one of those uh, go to word biblical commentary or another commentary that's going to help you get your own translation you're going to write down your translation again you pull this right out of the template you're going to write down your own translation and then uh, you're going to give an, out, an, an overview of your outline for your text. So now we're going to take that, ex, that biblical text and put it into an expository outline. All right. In other words, it's not topical. 
the reason it's expository, it's not topical. <laughs> so the reason I'm so emphatic is because we miss it so bad. Us Pentecostals, we just we have we struggle with this exegetical methodology to develop a, an expository sermon. So uh, you're going to give us the outline with the reasons and arguments. Okay, here's what's being said, here's what's being said, here's what's being said, line by line, line by line, right out of the biblical text, what's being said. You're going to give the syntax and the hermeneutic. This is what it means. This is what it's after. Here's what it means. After you've done all that, now you're, you've got your exegetical work done. You're going to resynthesize it back into the intent of the author, intent of the Holy Spirit with the appropriate, the appropriate hermeneutic. Okay, wow. Now you're going to go and enjoy, I hope and pray. Oh my goodness. The, the, uh, you know, after you do with me uh, 1 Corinthians 11, be transformed. You'll never be the same. It's an extremely important passage because, yes, it is foundational in the United Pentecostal Church International. It's in our manual, applied as uncut hair. And I wish I had time to tell you a few little stories along that line. But uh, in the Greek language, you're going to find how powerful it is, the hermeneutic, the intent, and what it then means to us. So, a little more lengthy today. However, uh, you know, this is cool. Are we having fun? I hope so. So, see you in a few minutes. Welcome back to our intro to preaching course. And we are dealing with the expository sermon. And we presented to you Brian Chappell's book, Christ Centered Preaching, and how that he spends a great deal of time on the expository message and presents it possibly as the most effective of all preaching methodologies because it's directly from the Word of God. It's line by line, Word of God, Word of God, and nothing gets more powerful than the Word of God. So that is a great argument. Uh, but uh, it is a wonderful way to preach, although many Pentecostals are not uh, very good at it, or some simply never ever do it, nor have done it. So you're going to do it in the class. And I'm going to do it now, but it's going to be, my presentation will be somewhat different than I expect yours to be, because hopefully you can follow some of the guidelines of chapel in that uh, he recommends for it to be one-third informational, one-third uh, illustration, and one-third application. One-third information, one-third illustration, one-third application. And so keeping a balance, keeping interest to people. However, I'm going to spend a great deal of time in information because, like I've said in this course, my goal for the course is for you to experience a work of transformation. So I'm taking advantage of, you'll see in a minute, how this is an extremely important topic to apostolic Pentecostalism and how the expository sermon fits perfectly the endeavor here to ingrain and graft into us the good word of God. So we're going to deal primarily with 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and, and walk, work our way through it, walk our way through it as we would in an, an, an expository message. So the first Corinthians chapter 11 here, uh, we're going to first of all deal with the literary context. So, of course, it comes from the book of, we call it the book, the letter of first Corinthians where Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and the church has some major problems that they bring to Paul and literally Paul addresses it in chapter 7, verse 1, where he says, the, the things which you wrote to me, I want to talk about. You wrote to me a letter, I'm answering the letter, and he starts that answer in chapter 7. As we, of course, have it broken out by the King James people that uh, divided up the, the book, the Bible. And so, chapters 1 to 4... We're going to talk about division being in the church and the reason for the division being carnality. And then chapter 5 and 6, we'll discuss some more problems in the church. And then again, chapter 7 is where we begin to answer the questions that have been brought to Paul's attention. 
And so chapter 7 is going to just be a chapter on the general marriage matters. And now chapter 8 through 14, literally the bulk of the entire uh, information in 1 Corinthians 11, the bulk of information is dealing with the agape love feast. Of course, it's not really agape love feast. That's kind of what I call it, just for sake of communication. Uh, the Greeks sort of called it the agape. It would, became to be known as the agape. That would be a meal that they would come together, a communal meal. They would come together and celebrate it similar to the Passover. So it followed the structures of Passover where that there would be the good food, great time of fellowship, a word of admonition, a preaching, if you will, exhortation. And then they would come to what they called the Last Supper. And, and that continued from the early time of the early church until about 100 AD when the particular pieces were broken apart and finally the the first two pieces were discarded and they maintained what we call the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> the reason was because they just couldn't do it all together. It all got intertwined, intermingled. And to solve the problem, the early church finally just customarily would say, uh, we'll do the Lord's Supper. Again, similar to how we manage it today. But back in the day, in the early parts of the early church, at the writings of 1 Corinthians, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 53 80, 50 to 53, Paul writes this letter. And again, he's primarily trying to fix the, the agape, the agape love feast. And so here you can see how that it's broken out. Uh, following the chiasm, the chiactic structure that uh, the common, commonly the Hebraic writers would use as they fought in concentric circles and did the writings in concentric circles, and, and, and we take that, and the best we can do is put it into the chiactic structure, but actually, it's quite inadequate. There's some things I really don't have time to get into today, but they're on the screen if you want to notice them. Uh, in, in the uh, green and then in the red, it's kind of like subtopics that are packaging uh, more information, but... It's, it's easy to see with the markings, the markers. And sometimes we call them bookends. The, the topic is introduced and then the topic is wrapped up. And then we have these concentric circles that finally is pointing in on the core, the most important piece of the information. So the most important piece of the information will be chapter 11. That's the focus of our expository sermon. <laughs> As I'm just laying the background here. And so when he's going to give us some instructions of how to actually do the agape. Now, uh, so in chapter 8, we are going to deal with the pagan idol meats. And there's powerful theologies, literally, uh, as you read this. And I don't have time to get into it. And uh, you guys don't want to be here all day with me. But I encourage you. Uh, th this is great theology, how Paul talks about, if I don't get this right, then then potentially I can do it wrong to the degree that I am committing idolatry and I'm entering into paganism, pagan style worship, and if I'm not, if I'm not entertaining the agape love feast properly. And so uh, he's going to give us the uh, contrast of the agape love feast to the pagan style of eating, and, uh, and that's going to be complemented, it's going to be wrapped up, the, the bookend on the other end is going to be some order of this agape love feast as he explains in chapter 14 matters concerning the execution of the spiritual gifts, chapter 14. Again, we're putting it in order and, and you can see how the, uh, there's a mirror image of the two topics. Uh, again, we're going to notice then in chapter number 9, we have agape in action and, and learning to be forbearing one with another. That is going to be echoed down in chapter number 13. We call it the great message on love, where that we are teaching not only forbearance, but we're teaching the abandonment of self and of personal rights as we're bearing with one another, loving one another. And then we're going to see that uh, it moves in chapter number 10 to the agape feast contrasted to the meals, the failed meals of Israel. So we first deal with, look at it concerning paganism, then we look at it concerning Israel. 
And uh, we notice that this is going to compare, again, with the order that he's giving, but now it's going to be the use, introduction of the use of the spiritual gifts. And again, right square in the middle of the most important segment of this entire repair of the agape, the repairing the agape love feast, is going to be chapter number 11, which again is the core, the most significant piece of the material. And so chapter 11, uh, let's narrow it on down into our particular discussion today. Uh, chapter 11, the Agape Love Feast, is dealing primarily with the topic of submission, submission and obedience. So uh, there's two pieces to submission. Uh, first has to be the willingness to abandon self-will and then a desire to embrace God's will. So it's kind of like chicken and egg, which one comes first? Uh, there is and should be the desire to do the will of God, okay? That should lead me then to being willing to abandon my will. And so this is extremely important because I've given it to you in the Greek how that uh, we have the willingness to abandon as uh, abandoning self-will. Self-will connects with self-law. Self-law is the best definition of the word anomia. So, of course, anomia is the opposite of nomia. Nomia is God's law. And, of course, God's will connects to God's law. <laughs> Makes sense? God's got a will. It connects with God's law, just like we have will that connects to a self-law, a law unto self. Now, why is this such a big deal? Well, because usually in most translations, now King James will translate the word anomia as iniquity. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Well, uh, many of the other translations will translate anomia as lawlessness. Well, that's somewhat of an inadequate translation. It is uh, lawlessness when you are anomia. Of course, ah is the prefix of nomia. Ah meaning antithesis of, against, or uh, opposite of. Opposite of God's law would be lawlessness. Yeah, but not really to fully understand. A real opposite of God's law is self-law. Why don't I want to follow God's law is because I'm pursuing my law to myself, and I can justify it, explain it. And so this, this material in 1 Corinthians 11 is a, a gift to us of God's law in the new covenant and a test to see if we're resistant God's law or still yet embracing self-law. Do I want to do it my way? Or am I willing to abandon my way and do it God's way? So two components to submission, as we're going to unpack here in chapter 11, extremely important. Why is it important? Well, let me ask. Do, is it fair? Uh, would it be appropriate for God to test the depth of our submission? What do you think? Would that, would, would that be an appropriate thing for God to do? Uh, when we look into the Word of God, you know, we can find some answers. For example, if you want to know if God tests the depth of submission, ask Abraham. <laughs> and uh, he'll tell you a story about going to Mount Moriah. Ask Hezekiah. Hezekiah will tell you about the time that the enemy leaders came into camp and God was testing him to see what was in his heart, the Scripture says. So, of course, there's many other examples, but... It does make sense that God would test us to see what is the depth and levels of our submission. Are we truly, truly consecrated to Him? Or are we just using Him for, quote unquote, bread and fish, just for our advantage? And potentially, God wants to know this is the real deal. We are fully yielded, consecrated, committed to Him, and not just using Him for our purpose. It's not our law, our gain, our purpose, our agenda, but we abandon all of that and yield completely to the will of God. So in order for that to be tested, there's two qualifiers, two tests for submission. 
One is the agreement test and the other is the understanding test. Uh, if I agree with somebody, you know, your parents or an authority, my parents say something that I agree with, that's not a test of submission. That's just giving me permission to do what I want to do. Yeah, you want to go eat supper? Well, let's go. You know, that's that's quick agreement. <laughs> and then uh, another test, since, since if I agree, it really is not a test of submission. And another would be if I understand it's really not a test of submission. Oh, I get it. They explain it to me. Oh, I get it. And I just yield. I submit. Because it makes good sense. So, of course, there would be many examples we could talk about. But I think we get the idea that if submission is submission, it's got to be proven submission. It's got to be tested. And it will be tested on the test of agreement and on the test of understanding. So, where in the Bible, then, do we find such tests? In the New Testament, where do we find specific material that we don't understand or that we don't agree with? And there may be several places, but before we're done, hopefully we, we will agree that, yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is a place that God tests our heart because, one, we don't understand the passage, and two, we, in our base nature, we don't agree necessarily with the teaching. But as we walk into it, we will notice that it comes in supreme importance. For one, contextually, in the literal context, the first portion, the first 16 verses, in repairing the love feast, is dealing with the head, or the head covering. Or another summary term would be simply covering. Just dealing with the concern, the issue of a covering. And then, of course, the last section, from moving from verse 17 forward through the end of the chapter, we're dealing literally with the order of the feast itself. So before Paul gets into explaining how to execute what we call the Lord's Supper, or the communion, the communion service, uh, before we go to that, actual segment that oftentimes we use in our services when we're doing the, the communion service, Paul is going to first of all talk about the need and the means of covering. Before he gets to explaining, you know, the what, and I'll get to that here in a little while, he's going to first use rhetorical tools to, to emphasize these ordinances. So he, he says they're ordinances, uh, another word for that would be traditions. And so he is going to use these rhetorical tool, tools similar. Uh, a comparison could be the attorney who has been presenting a trial, prosecuting a trial or defending a trial for a season of time. And whenever the, the point is brought up, it's going to have to be explained in detail. And so it may take, you know, hours to explain a particular detail, but after they've done detail one, detail two, detail three, ever how many details they are, there is, then they will come to the very end, and, and closing arguments is when they, of course, they've already spent all the time in hammering it all out, now they're just going to do a quick summary. And they're going to make their point, emphasize it as best they can in a closing argument. And it feels like that is what Paul is doing as he is uh, hitting us with powerful closing statements like an attorney would, would do in the closing arguments of a trial. It's, every one of these is a one-liner standalone. It in itself is a good enough reason to say, all right, I'll follow the tradition. That's a powerful point. I'm willing to yield. I, I abandon self-law, I'll embrace God's law, based on that one point. However, Paul hits us 18 times, just pounding us with these powerful one-line statements. And every one of them, can I, you could spend a full lesson on every one. And of course, we're not here to do that. I'm, I'm moving through this as an expository movement, hopefully to come to an application that is extremely important for us. And so, uh, just an example here. In, in the opening line, he says, uh, you must become. It's actually stronger than that. So, 
What I've done is I've taken every single verse in, in, in indicative, a second person plural, so forth and so on. I've done all the parsing of the entire passage, the 16 verses. And uh, then we have given the syntactical purpose. This in our expository sermons is something really, really, really we should do. Uh, <laughs> it, it is a pet peeve. It is a, a, a soapbox to stand on to say there's a lot of times preaching goes forth where there hadn't been appropriate work behind the scene to really ascertain the hermeneutic of the passage. So this is extremely important that if we are people of integrity, if we're integrous to ourself, integrous to our God, integrous to the precious people, integrous to the Word of God, then surely, I'm telling you, is there anything more important than the soul of man? Any more important than the delicate work that we do? I say not. So we should take the effort and time to say, okay, I'm willing to, particularly on important, sensitive topics, I'm willing really to dig down and do the homework of the hard work, if you will, of translation. So why? Because the syntactical usage of every word is extremely important. Why did the author, in this case, of course, it's Paul, why out of six or out of 17 different possibilities of using the genitive case, why did he particularly chose, choose to use uh, the genitive in this instance? And the answer is because it best serves a sentence as an objective genitive. Won't get into the detail, but uh, this, is, this is how we do the work in, in getting the, the syntactical information because, because all of the syntactical information can be inserted right into the translation as we are seeking the hermeneutic. Again, what is the hermeneutic? That is the intent. The intent. The intention of the author, what is the meaning and understanding as intended by the author? So, who's the author of 1 Corinthians? Well, it's the Apostle Paul plus the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved on Paul to write, according to uh, 1 Peter. So, uh, it's extremely important. What is in their mind? What is their intention? What are they trying to communicate? What is the understanding? And so... To get this, we need to go into the syntactical function of these particular words. Why did he choose to make it an imperative, a present deponent, indicative, second person plural? And that's the reason why I said a moment ago that the translation I've given it, you must, is a little weak because it's a powerful imperative that... You must, you, a, a, a way of saying it would be become, <laughs> become, come on, get it, become. It's like an imperative that yet is a passive. Now the deponent uh, indicates it's both passive and active all wrapped up into the same word. So it's passive because to become something, it's a passive work, something's being done to you. But it's an active effort, same time, simultaneous, in the deponent to say, okay, I've been commanded. There's a command for me to become. And to become what? Well, to become an imitator. Uh, it's actually a plural for all of us to become imitators of Paul. So, and this is just verse 1. We literally could spend easily an hour on every verse. I don't want to do that. But to get the idea of how important this kind of work is, particularly in expository preaching, that, that what is the message? What's the effort, the driving force, the meaning, the understanding of the apostle? Well, to become Im imitator. And so I've unpacked it a bit to you must become. And pulling from the Theological Dictionary New Testament word, Kittle's writing, of course, you've been around me long enough to know that's my favorite uh, uh, dictionary, theological dictionary to work from. Kittle does an outstanding job, and he and his, his co-laborers. But you must become born, be produced, be made, be corrected. And uh, that is also from Brown's drivers and Briggs. But uh, into a new state of being. 
other lexicons involved here. You, you must become into a new state of being. After you've been born again, isn't it interesting for, uh, that Titus 3.5 speaks about regeneration by the washing? So there's ongoing regenerations, works of regeneration. We get renewed, regenerated, reborn. He says you need to assume a new state of being as an imitator. I, I like a better word than that, and, and to do it over, I'd probably write it in there. A disciple. To be a real, genuine disciple, you must become a, a, a person of habitual conduct. See, there's the chicken and the egg again. That when you practice something, it works on you in the shaping of who you are. Out of who you are comes your behaviors. You do the practice, it turns into a heart shaping, and the heart shaping produces the behaviors. So if you will work 21 days, uh, make something a habit, that's what they say it takes. 21 days of the same act, action day after day after day, till it becomes a habit, then it's truly shaping your inner person. Chicken and egg process. Which one's first? Well, they kind of come together. That you becoming as you are doing, and as you are doing, you are becoming. And this is extremely important. When we study Jesus' teaching, He says, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Pharisees focused on the behaviors, on the externals. And He said, you've got to have it bigger than that, better than that. It's got to be down in your heart. You must become. Become a doer by habitual conduct. Or what? Of Paul. Just as Paul is of Christ. So based upon a, an appeal of discipleship. Let's get this, family. Let's get this, church. Let's be disciples of Jesus Christ. Follow. Based upon that, now again, that's a standalone. That's one argument that good, good enough in itself should, should say, whatever we're talking about, I'm in. I want to be a disciple. That's my whole life program. Whatever it is, just count me down. Uh, here, here's a mandate to become a disciple. So based upon this, I, I yield, I follow. Uh, on to the second appeal in verses 2. Uh, first section and second section, section he says I'm going to praise you because of all the things that you do for me and have done for me you guys are great uh, so I'm not being negative uh, I want to be affirming but just as I delivered to you you guys uh, it's very important to hold fast the traditions sometimes translated ordinances so again in our English language in the context of life a lot of times we don't get it. This is why our homework is so extremely important. That Paul is making an appeal based upon the traditions. Hold fast the traditions. He's going to talk about two traditions in this passage. Again, the core of the whole material to fix the agapi. Two traditions. Number one is the covering, the concern of covering. And number two is, of course, the order of the agape, the, uh, agape love feast itself. He says, those two traditions I, I consider extremely important. Now in verse number 23, chapter 11, he is going to say specifically that these traditions are derived from the Lord. So uh, chapter 15, Corinthians, he talks about how he saw the Lord. He was one born out of due season, comes on late, but he sees the Lord. And uh, a qualifier to be an apostle would be that he had to have uh, been with Jesus and seen Jesus for him to be qualified as an apostle. And so many scholars embrace a concept that Paul literally spent time with Jesus Christ in a physical regard. That in imagery or even physiologically there was a time that Paul spent with Jesus Christ and uh, if that is the case, then it would explain Galatians, how that Paul describes his, his path, his journey, as being, I didn't learn any of this from the apostles. I didn't even spend time with the apostles. No, I was in the Arabian desert, and I spent all my time out there at the feet of Jesus, and this is where I learned this stuff. Regardless, by definition, a tradition is something that's handed down Handed down from the teacher to the disciples. So by definition, by definition, 
It is something that the individual, the, the Paul in our instance, Paul, cannot invent. Somebody said, well, if Paul would have had a wife, he never would have talked about that, that hair stuff. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, Paul didn't have a wife. But the truth is, it, Paul didn't invent it anyway. By definition, it's a tradition that was handed to Paul. And Paul, now again, this is Kittle, demands that the churches should keep it since salvation depends upon it. And various verses of Scripture in support, but salvation depends upon it. That's powerful language. Salvation depends upon it. You know, again, it's a standalone. Enough said. Tell me what, the, what it is we're talking about. I'll do it. Second point. He's got 18 of these hammer clauses where he just nails it down. And uh, salvation depends upon it. He sees no antithesis between pneumonatic piety and the highest summation of tradition. So pneumatic, of course, speaking about the spirit, spiritual piety, spiritual righteousness, uh, spiritual holiness. He says there's no difference between this tradition and your spiritual relationship. Your prayer life, your whatever life, spiritually speaking, piety is as important as this tradition, this tradition is just as important as the, this uh, spiritual piety righteousness. The essential point for Paul is that it's been handed down. Essential point. Again, he didn't invent it. By definition, a tradition has been handed down, derived from the Lord, and it's only what now Paul yields himself to. He's following and he is going to submit himself to this particular understanding. And so in the days of Paul, tradition is in process acquiring, acquiring a fixed verbal form. And it's, it's being explained here. Uh, the Lord's Supper, it's celebration, and the appropriate words come from the Lord again. It's not what Paul has invented. It's what he's received and he's just passing on. So again, just in the first two points, we have two powerful standalones to say, good enough. Teach me what is this tradition and I want to do it. I want to be a disciple. I, I want, it's a matter of my salvation. I want to be plugged in. And so uh, Paul continues. And like I said, there's 18 such strong appeals. I want you to understand the first appeal is we're going to talk about headship. Headship is... Pointing to the head, and there's you know quite a bit of theology that Cap, uh, uh, Capitan, uh, my Greek's with me right now, but regardless, it implies source. It's not only talking about the head; it's talking about the source, the head sourcing. So it is a foundational principle that we we see the head of man. The head of man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. And but Christ, the head, is God. So based upon headship, let's honor headship. It is a foundational principle. Again, in Bible, the foundations are extremely important. He continues to another one that is not quite so heavyweight, but it's worth stating that he is sensitive to cultural sensitivity because if a man had his head covered, in the particular culture of the Corinthians, it implied homosexuality. And Paul is saying we do want to pay attention to the culture and, and uh, to be culturally sensitive. There's an appeal based upon function. This is far more powerful that the function is to reflect glory. So if the man is not, uh, if he is covering his head, we're going to discover what that's talking about in a few minutes. But if he covers his head, he is humiliating his head. He's robbing his head of the chief function to reflect glory. So uh, the scripture tells us that we're talking about glory, that God is quite jealous. So he will share his glory with no other. The glory belongs to God. But God is a God of giving. He gives His glory. But it's not to be kept and embraced and, and uh, hogged. It's to be yielded back. 
And therein is a multiplication of glory back to God. So we see it in the Old Testament, just in the foundational principle again of creation, when the God says, let the Spirit move over the face of the waters because water reflects. So there would be the reflection of the glory of God. And then we watch that being unpacked in creation of human when the, He says, let us make man in our own image. In the image of God, God made man, male and female created to them. So here is God pouring out glory into the human, expecting the glory to be returned. This is going to teach us how the glory is to be returned to God. Extremely important for God to get His glory. <laughs> He's not going to share it with anybody else. If anybody circumvents this process, they're going to be in trouble. It just like makes sense. This is important to render to God what's due. The glory to God. How do we do it? Well, here's one way. We honor the covering, the source of covering. We honor headship and we honor the source of covering. If I, as a male, cover my head, I am humiliating uh, my head, which of course is Jesus. I am stopping the flow of glory and it's not being the reflection of glory back to Christ. And likewise, if every woman is not covered in the same manner, and uh, then she is disgracing her head, which of course her head would be her husband, that she is not honoring him. And again, the big piece here is she's breaking the flow of the glory. The glory that can originate in her is the flow to the male, her husband, then to Christ, to God, according to what Paul is teaching us here. And he says, here's an appeal upon honoring the purpose to reflect the glory. And similar is the purpose of honoring headship. And uh, honoring headship, honoring the source, all this kind of flows together as we're seeing God in the creative order uh, making the man out of the woman and the man. I'll explain more in a minute. There's an appeal based upon shame. Paul says it's one of the same for her to have been shaved. That it is a shame for her uh, to, to uh, uh, disgrace her, her head. She's shaming herself. There is an appeal based upon the telos. So Paul would have been very familiar with this terminology. It was first given to us by Aristotle. So of course Paul, in his own right, is quite a philosopher. And uh, he had the equivalent of three PhDs three PhD degrees, and a brilliant man. And so he was not intimidated on Mars Hill. Uh, Mars Hill uh, is when he comes and introduces the resurrection. And as he's moving into that path, they then took it as funny and, and so to speak, laughed him to scorn. But anyway, it's got a tilt into that follows its nature. Its nature is given to it with a tilt that it's going to have an aim that, that it's got a reason to exist. And it, it, by design, is to do what it's to do to fulfill its objective for the reason that it exists. So uh, in creation, everything is there with meaning and purpose by the Creator. You could ask questions, well, what that's for? What does that do? And probably it fits into the food chain someplace. But uh, that being another topic, let me just talk about the telos of the human that God gives us a nature, and the nature has a bend to fulfill the purposes of God. And Paul now talks about the nature here as the telos that, that if I am willing to submit to the law of God, then my telos is being fulfilled. I'm bending toward the law of God. I'm abandoning the areas of self-nature as I am giving myself to God's nature and the ways of God here. And, and uh, he says, based upon the telos, upon the end. Uh, it's, a, it's a constrained sense used by the philosophers such as Aristotle. It, it's the, it is the root to the term teleology or teleological uh, that we sometimes refer to roughly specifying purpose or aim or the objective, the, the uh, objective, and intentionality. So he's making this appeal 
And uh, it continues on into the next verse, as Paul will say in verse number six, to cut one's hair or to shave oneself, disgraceful to the woman. See, I translated it according to the syntax that we have uh, the word disgraceful, shameful, serving in opposition. So uh, the appositive in English grammar follows the subject. It, it's separated in our writings with commas, but it follows the, the subject and it renames the subject. It serves in opposition, renaming the subject. So, so to cut one's hair, uh, renaming what we're talking about, disgraceful to the woman, uh, then let her cover her head. So, uh, A, since or if. Since to cut one's hair is disgraceful, shaming herself is great disgraceful, let her cover her head. And uh, then he, he, again, pointing to the telos, that there's a bend that, uh, that if I am willing to yield to the appropriate bend of God and submit, then I'm going to follow the ordinances of the covering. If I follow my base nature, there's the telos, that is bending me against the ways of God, it has its own end and its own purpose, which is my own self. Bottom line is, there's a deeper something working in me. So the telos kind of goes back to the nomia and anomia. Am I really submitted to the law of God or am I willing to uh, do things my way, follow my law? Again, every one of these is a standalone, powerful statements. Paul makes an appeal based upon the function to re reflect again in verse number seven. And so it's kind of a repeat. And, but also I'm going to, to, to introduce how that Paul is giving us a moral obligation. So according to uh, Rogers and Rogers' exegetical uh, work, uh, the word, whenever there is what we translate the word should, I'm sorry, we translate the word ought. Um, to us, the word ought means should. You ought to do that. Oh, you should have done that. Yeah. Ought means should. It's recommendation. But in the Greek, whenever there is the word ought that is followed with an infinitive. So, of course, a verb converted into an infinitive in English language, we take the verb cover and insert the word to. To cover converts it into an infinitive. Matter of fact, take any verb, run, jump, the word to in front makes it into the infinitive. So we're going to take uh, the word all connected to an infinitive. And according to Rogers and Rogers, the reference, that is presenting us with a moral obligation. A moral obligation. All of a sudden the text has been, now been elevated to alongside the Ten Commandments. Moral obligations. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shall not commit adultery, so forth. Powerful, powerful, important message being communicated based upon morality. A man ought not to cover his head because he's the image and glory of God. God designated for him to reflect this glory flow because he is the image glory of God and, uh, and the woman is the glory of the man she doesn't want to stop the, the glory flow. And so Paul continues into discussion into uh, an appeal based upon origin. Man is not from the woman. The woman came from the man. She came out of his rib. And the, woman, the man was not created because of the woman, but the woman was be created because of the man. So God created him. God did not create them. As Paul is making this appeal on creation, we see that God created him, created Adam singularly by himself, of course. And then chapter 2 is going to explain what God does, how that he reaches into the rib and makes the woman out of the man. And we end up with the Ish and the Isha.
But when we see the creation, it's first of all, of course, Adam. And the point is, this is important stuff. That we're looking back into creation. We're establishing the creation order. Paul is appealing it based upon creation order. This seems to be a bigger topic than what we understand because we study. Again, it's, a, you know, it's an easy an hour to talk about this. That there's the restoration of all things coming. That God is going to redeem everything. We're going back into the uh, uh, pre-fall type of a world when the, everything's completely restored. So uh, Paul is challenging us apparently to get it spiritually done right within ourselves first, go ahead and yield to the nomia of God, the order of God, and there's the appeal based upon creation. There in verse number 10 is the appeal based upon morality. And I just mentioned it already, it's more obligation. Because of this, the woman ought, again, connected to an infinitive, the woman ought to have authority on her head as we make the appeal based upon morality. And then in verse number 10, Paul makes the appeal based upon because of the angels. And this could be the most important piece because Paul right here gives us the reason. Why do we do, why do we have the concern of the covering, the reflecting of glory, the creative order being established, reestablished, etc. And on because of the angels. So I've heard this explained from many different perspectives and some explanations are great. And uh, there's actually a, a lot of supposition in a good explanation. I've heard it taught that uh, because of the angels is making reference to the bad angels. That the bad angels blew it and they got thrown out. And so we don't want to blow it and get thrown out type of thing. And I can say this, that from the standpoint of scholarship, that's an inappropriate explanation because we have in the text the use of the definite article. The definite article... Uh, following rules of translation would tell us, no, we're not talking about evil angels. We're talking about the angels, the righteous angels. So based upon the righteous angels, based upon the angels, Paul says, this is what we do. We, we follow the ordinance about the coverings because of the angels. All right, good enough? Because of the angels. Well, the reality is, if you, again, go into the sources of scholarship... Now, I know the Holy Ghost can give us revelation and we can have some good explanations. But in terms of scholarship, what does that mean? And the answer is, in scholarship, there is no answer. We do not know what that phrase means in scholarship. So all the research, all the digging, all following the historical developments, reaching into antiquities and trying to discover what does that phrase mean, there's no answer, no answer. So it seems like it is an idiomatic phrase. It's just a particular phrase that was uh, apart and available that day uh, that you could say, and it just makes sense. So, of course, our cultures have these type of things. But let me give you an example out of the Bible, how that uh, Jesus gives us, similarly, a little idi idiomatic, <laughs> you know, idi ideological phrase and uh, it's remember Lot's wife so as soon as he says, says this remember Lot's wife the audience knows what he's talking about matter of fact we know what he's talking about because of course we know the backdrop we know the story out of the book of Genesis remember Lot's wife nothing else needs to be said we know the whole drama Lot's wife now what would have happened had the piece of history in Genesis not been incorporated into the, into the canon, into the scriptures. What if uh, that particular piece was not there when Jesus says, remember Lot's wife? Maybe the audience, because of oral traditions, knew what it meant, but what would we do with the phrase, remember Lot's wife, out of the words of Jesus if we didn't have Genesis to reflect on? Could not we come up with all kinds of stuff, what that would mean? And uh, again, it's a phrase that means powerful stuff because we have the backdrop teaching us what is implied. And so with the phrase, because of the angels, it seems like it too is one of those uh, historical phrases that 
obviously means something very powerful. But 2,000 years later, it, we, it's lost its meaning. And again, from the standpoint of scholarship, we do not know what it means. Because of the angels, don't know what it means. So do all this. Why? Because of the angels. All right. Okay. Well, tell us. And one of these days, we will understand what it means. Amen. There's an appeal based upon perfection. That the woman, apart from the man, is not complete. The man, for not, apart from the woman, is incomplete. So... Uh, doing worship properly together is a component of perfection. He continues, says there's an appeal based upon unity, relationship, reciprocity, gender, mutuality, and respect. And so the woman is of the, as the woman is from the man, like way the man is by means of the woman, all things are out of God. So just wrapping it up, you know, he, he finally makes an appeal based on what's proper. Is, is this just proper or improper? He makes an appeal based upon nature. What does nature teach you? And then he makes a, a, an appeal based upon, again, glory, advantage, covering. That uh, he's saying these things, that this is extremely important. And uh, then finally, there is the appeal based upon church polity. He says... It doesn't matter what you have to say about this. This is just the way that it is. It's this in all the churches. Somebody says, well, that passage is only uh, contextually meant for the Corinthians. And so it's come and gone. It's usage today. And so ignore. No, 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 no. Paul, of course, he says all the churches. So he says this teaching conforms to all the churches. Secondly, we know that the letters were circulated to all the churches and, and they all would embrace it. And then thirdly, this material would jump across cultures. It's not culturally relevant just to the Corinthians. The, the Corinthians church was cosmopolitan. It had many different ethnicities and cultures wrapped up in it. And so... Uh, it is reaching beyond the cultures, beyond the cities, beyond the locations, and even across time spans. Because as he writes around 50 or so, he's reaching into a population that's been in the church potentially for a number of years. He's reaching to the contemporary uh, population. And the letter is going to be with us for, uh, well, first of all, an additional 50 years until the right, finishing writings of the Bible. And then on that uh, uh, we are reaching multi-generational. This is having a generational impact to reach to all ages, all cultures, all ethnicities, all churches. It's just the way that it is. And he says, if anybody wants to be argumentative, I'm sorry, it's the custom. It's how we operate. And I've already given you all these reasons why if you don't get it, then just, <laughs> just do it. All right, just do what? What are we talking about? So uh, we're going to move out of the expository line by line to now understanding what the passage means as what is the purpose and intent, the hermeneutic of the Apostle Paul. So, of course, we're correcting the abuses in the Corinthian church. We, uh, we dealt with carnality, chapter 1, sexual improprieties in chapters 4 and 5, and now we're, dealt, we're fixing that agapi, chapter 8 through 15. we got issues concerning resurrection, obviously, as we're going to spend chapter 15 on. And so when we're talking about the agapi in chapters 8 through 14, uh, we're primarily moving right into the matter of submission. That this submission to headship, submission to order, submission to God's will, submission bottom line to nomia. Now again, let me emphasize, why is that so important? Because... Whenever there is not submission to God's law, that means there's self-law at work. And that's the reason Matthew chapter 7, uh, it's emphasized, I believe in verse number 23, depart from me, you that work lawlessness, you that work anomia, uh, you would not submit to the nomia, to the order of God's law. So again, to test this submission, we're going to see uh, if it's something we agree with in our base nature, do we take uh, some adversarial position? Or, secondly, it's going to be tested on the, on the piece of understanding. And, and, and as we demonstrated, because of the angels, is so here's one place in the New Testament that we can say we don't really understand what it means. we got supposition, we got some ideas, but to really 
no one is trying to communicate. We simply don't know what that phrase really means. The meaning's been lost. So here is one portion of scripture in the New Testament where the depth of our submission can be tested because we fully do not have the full understanding. And does it go against base nature? Arguably, it seems that yes, what's the big deal? Why do I need to do that? Why, you mean, that's such a little thing. Uh, do I really have to? Somebody says, was that a heaven or hell issue? Uh, when I hear that particular line, it tells me somebody's really got a major focus on heaven and hell when they really should put their focus on relationship with Jesus Christ. That hell is an outcome of being lost, and lost is, is simply something out of place. And out of place means it's lost its usefulness. Usefulness is driven by relationship. I know that's a mouthful, but when I'm in relationship with him, that's when I can be used by him. Outside of relationship with him, I have no authority. I have no usefulness. I'm lost. I didn't want to go to hell. I just ended up in hell because I was lost. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to hell today. That's not the intent. No. We end up in hell because we were lost. We got lost because we got out of place. And that means we lost our usefulness because we lost relationship. If I'll focus on relationship, the other pieces will come in play. Is that a heaven or hell issue? Well, take all that little spin I just gave and chew it up and swallow it. Uh, and we can talk about it more. But uh, let transformation work inside of us. And, and so uh, the... The phrase, the topic at hand, it's the translation of one word. Why is it such a big deal? Well, we've given all kinds of reasons why, but it all gets wrapped around the word, the Greek word, coma, coma. And so coma, uh, translated many times, like in New King James, King James is have long hair, has long hair. Now, I take issue with the translation. I'm sorry, <laughs> translators uh, can't, well, I want to be careful, but it's very helpful to be able to dig into the Greek, the Hebrew, and give appropriate translation. And you'll see why here. Because we take this word, coma, that is, trend, that is parsed as a present active subjunctive. Subjunctive is a clause that will show purpose. It's a big deal. It's showing purpose. Subjunctive. Present, present tense, active voice. So I'm going to take a present active verb, one word, comma, and I'm going to translate it into three words. Well, I don't have a problem translating it into three words as, as much as I do the three words chosen. First of all, the word has. Has fails to appropriately translate coma because has serves English as a helping verb, not an action verb. It's not an action verb, and we're trying to communicate action, present active. If there's an action verb that we're trying to translate, and has, does, there's no action. Has tends to show possession. So... Uh, you can have something showing possession of it. That's not the intention, that's not the hermeneutic of what the apostle is trying to give us here. It has is a helping verb, like it, it has broken, and it's, it's very close to the, to the verb of being, like I am broken. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, it serves as a helping verb, like the verb of beings is or uh, was and were serve as helping verbs also. So it does not demonstrate action, it's not active, it does demonstrate passivity, such as it has been broken, totally passive, it's been done to it. So again, the word has is inappropriate, it fails to translate coma, because again, of the word usage that the apostle has chosen. And a matter somewhat worse is that has implies possession attainment, and uh, both concepts, the Apostle Paul would have avoided ha if he could, because he does not want works-based legalism. 
Whenever you possess something, you've got it, and you've attained, then there's a legalism connected to that. I'm, I've arrived, and it circumvents the spiritual development process. Paul was all about the spiritual development process. And so, again, has is quite inadequate in, in the, translating the Greek word coma. So, moving forward then, let me talk about hair. The two words long hair, has long hair, uh, is, it gives us this inappropriate phrase. So what I've done is translate it because if a man grow hair or grow long his hair, if a woman grow long her hair, that's the way I've translated it, making it more appropriate, more appropriate translation. And in a few minutes we'll unpack it, see what it really means, but let's first of all deal with the translation. So, coma, uh, being translated into has long hair, what is, what is the word hair? In what part of speech is hair? For us, of course, hair is a thing, person, place, or thing. It's a noun. It serves in the part of speech of a noun, the thing on top of the head. Well, coma, again in the Greek, is parsed as a present active subjunctive verb. If you take a verb, one word, and move it into three words, that is a noun phrase, has long hair, hair being the word of emphasis, emphasizing hair, it just should make sense. We've lost a big piece of the meaning. From a verb into a noun construct, we've lost a big piece of the meaning. And so we're not translating the, the words appropriately. Translating a verb into a noun modifies the meaning and the hermeneutic, the intent of the author. The word long, making matters worse. Hair, serving as a noun, is inappropriate, but the word long serves as an adjective in this particular noun construct. It modifies and describes a hair in terms of length. Length, of course, is a descriptive measurement. So this is legalistic. This is against, literally against, the intent, the hermeneutic, what the author would not want. So in terms of coma, it's not intended to emerge in legalistic term of length, shoulder length, bend back length, etc. No, it is a verb, a present active verb that is not uh, intended to come out in noun constructs. So has long hair, first of all, has long hair, all three words, Stand as an inappropriate translation. Grow long hair or grow hair long are both better <laughs> translations. Okay, so why do I say that? Because if we take the word grow and keep it as primary emphasis and focus, why? Because coma is an active verb. We need an active verb to help us get the most clear and appropriate translation. Grow will serve as an active verb. And so it serves as the action verb translating coma. If we use long as an adjective, it's out of bounds. It's teaching us we've got a noun phrase. Long is one of those English words which will serve either as an adverb or an adjective. And honestly, that's a big piece of the problem. One word flips into adverb or adjective in the English language and gives us this confusion. So we need to keep long as an adverb. How do we do that? Well, uh, we let the word long stay close to the word grow and making it, uh, working it to be an adjective, not uh, an adverb, not an adjective. So, in the, in, the, in the translation, grow hair, grow long his hair. On purpose, this particular translation is emphasizing grow long, explaining how it grows. It's, longly is not a word, but if it were a word, that'd be inappropriate way of saying grow longly. How do you grow? Grow long his hair. So this moves the word of hair a little bit away from long, separates it, keeps long close to the grow, the action verb, and the reader then better realizes the intent and uh, the hermeneutic of the passage. 
And alternatively, if, if you don't like that, then let's use grow hair long. It's going to do the same thing. And uh, long is in a more adverbial role than the adjectival role, since long follows the noun. So if we put long in front of the noun, it's an adjective. Long hair, it's an adjective. Put long after the noun, grow hair long, then long serves as adverb and it's more appropriate. So accordingly, the phrase let hair grow, wearing, uh, wear growing hair, uh, is, is appropriate uh, translations as well. So if you want to go to the scholars, the scholars are going to say basically the same thing. Strong's Dictionary, Shorter Lexicon, New Testament says wear long hair, uh, one's hair grow long fairs, Greek, English, and so forth. Expository Dictionary, New Testament, Vines, uh, let hair grow, have long hair, Vine says secondly, but let the hair grow. So again, the scholars are saying the same type of thing. Regardless, <laughs> Oh, I'm coming to close. Hallelujah. Regardless, the topic points to Paul's intent to communicate what the Lord Jesus had given him as an ordinance, as a tradition that he needed to hand down. I received it from the Lord. I've delivered it to you. So here's the point. The point is I've got a hermeneutically, I've got a hermeneutic I want to perfectly align and agree with the hermeneutic of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, it's what, of course, Paul's given to us. So what is the hermeneutic? What is the meaning of 1 Corinthians 11? What is the original intent of this Greek word coma? It's not something you have. It's something you do. It's an action verb. So I have long... No, no, no. It's not what you have. It's what you do. Not something you attain or measure but it's something that happens to you as a result of obedience, or another way of saying it, it's a work of grace. So, what do you do to grow hair? Well, you eat, and you sleep, and what do you do to grow hair? You just kind of live. It's like the natural order of life. You just receive it. Receive the growth as a result of life. In other words, it's a work of grace. You didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to make it happen. It happens to you. That's what Paul wants. The working of, for the ladies, the hair to grow as a work of grace. They receive the grace as they live in obedience to what Paul has taught here. So it then means the act, the action. Coma means the action of grow. Growing, that growing is producing. So uh, let's drill down a little bit. Somebody asked the question, well, how do you, coma, how do you grow hair long? What's it mean, grow hair long? How do you do that? See, you can't ask, the, the question gets asked a lot of times, what is long hair? Well, tell me what is, you can't even ask it. You can't address a verb like that. What is rough? You address verbs on, with how do you. How do you run? How do you coma? So asking the question, how do you coma? Let me ask, how do you not grow hair long? So flipping it around, the adverse. How do you not grow hair long? You cut it. So how do you grow hair long? You don't cut it. So to do coma is to grow hair long. You do not cut it. Hence, coma implies uncut hair. And so what we're going to see now, Paul says it basically the same way. <laughs> in chapter, in verse 14, verse 15, he used the verb coma, grow hair long. But in verse 15, he says, but the hair, now we have noun, coma, or I'm sorry, coma, feminine, feminine singular nominative, the subject, hair as a subject, the hair, the noun, on top of the head, instead of a covering, has been given to her. 
It is the result. Again, has been given. From the Greek word that's parsed as passive. A passive gift that is given. In other words, the outcome of the obedience. The obedience is the growing hair, not cutting it. The outcome is the hair. It doesn't matter the length. The length is not the discussion. It's the matter of cut or uncut. Some people get hair two inches, three inches, five inches. Some ladies get hair down below their knees. There's some that can walk on their hair. Length doesn't matter. What does matter is what God has given as a work of grace, as it's been yielded to in obedience, following the gnomia of God. So the uncut hair, faithfully grown upon the head of the submitted woman, produces the symbol of submission. So it's a symbol of authority. New King James gives it this accordingly. And it is appropriate. You can see it in italics because it's inserted. The symbol. The symbol of authority. She ought to have authority. She ought to uh, keep authority upon her head because of the angels she needs that symbol so Paul is teaching us to have faithfully to faithfully grow hair and make it a worship lifestyle so bearing the symbol without living submitted uh, is hypocrisy I act like I'm submitted when I'm really not submitted that's hypocrisy, and of course, that's what Jesus judged the most harshly. Faithfully growing hair makes worship into a lifestyle. Because you just can't show up for an hour for a communion service and say, I'm growing my hair. It's a lifestyle, and then it turns into a lifestyle of worship. Now let's take it to the next level, because we then discover that submission is worship. And worship is submission. So the attitude of nomia, in contrast to anomia, is the biggest piece. That God, of course, knows the heart. And when I live in worship, submission is a natural outflow. And then the outflow should be the symbol for the gentleman to maintain the haircut and then for the ladies to maintain the hair growing, grow the hair. And the men, of course, keep the hair cut. A great lesson, a great expository, great application. Life stuff here because it's dealing with worship unto our God. A heart of no man. Well, how was that? Maybe you've heard it like that before, maybe never not, but it's expository line by line. That's an expository sermon. Needs to have an application, of course. Every sermon needs to have opportunity for response when they interact then with the Holy Spirit and let God uh, help them. Now, it's your place to take the expository sermon and develop and write your own outline. It has to start with the exegetical outline that you pull from the template online. So it's two different assignments. Number one is the exegetical outline comes back with this, as well as the expository message itself with the biblical text comes back. Now, remember, you're going to be doing the same exegetical work on your final sermon. That's the reason I only wanted two verses for your final sermon, because it's uh, exegetical work kind of heavy. Now, uh, as we move on, you're going to continue to read and finish Robinson, and uh, soon you'll be doing a, a uh, reflection paper on Robinson, and it, it will be due soon. All right, very good. Thank you for being with me in week four. See you at week five. God bless you.